We're really pleased to welcome some visitors this morning, and I will just ask you to stand uh, when I read your name. Carl Berta. There you are, Carl. Did I do that right? Oh, close. Okay. <laughs> See? <laughs> you set me up. <laughs> Luann Kaiser. Deirdre Tuller Novak. Great. Shay Cobbs. Douglas Bird. Great. Angela Scripps. John Cobbs. Gail Weigel. Weigel. Sorry about that, Gail. <laughs> and Pat Scripps. Let's give them all a round of applause. <laughs> and then we have several new members who haven't been recognized yet, but today I think we've got about 10. So uh, let's find our new members, and I'll ask them to come up here, please. Patricia Denner. Paul Husingfeld, Doug Johnson, Bob Kenny, Louise Kenny, <laughs> Taya Tammer, Nancy Timmer, and Luis Toledo. We're pleased to welcome these new members. Please join me in the Thank you, Betty, and welcome, everyone. Great to have you here. You're dismissed, right. Thank you for coming up. <laughs> so we have a great program today, and I'm going to ask Joyce Mott from our program committee to come up and introduce our program and speaker. Um, the art of Barry Ells is reflected in his photography as well as in his paintings. He was formally educated in fine arts with a distinguished oil painting career spanning more than 30 years. He has had prominent commercial photography studios in St. Louis, Chicago, Boston, New York, and Holland, Michigan. His photography includes the, art, the world of advertising, fashion, sports, personalities, and still life with campaigns for major national clientele and features in prominent publications. His hardcover portrait book was a New York Times bestseller. We are privileged to have Barry share the personal experiences of his journey, experiences that required some miracles to make this creative profession become a reality. Please welcome Barry Ells. Thanks, thanks, Joyce, and to Hass for inviting me. Oh, it's going to be dark, isn't it? <laughs> I don't know if I can read this. I've got a kind of a script because I've got a lot of images. Yeah, it's somewhere in between. Go down just a little bit is still good. So you can see these. That's, that's good. This too? Yeah. OK, thank you. Um, so um, this is Michael Jordan. Um, uh, he's, uh, uh, if you can imagine, I'm in a private practice with him. He's the most famous human being in the world at this time. And I've got, a, I'm carrying a Nikon camera and a large telephoto lens. You know, they're about like this. And I was in this practice session with him, um, <clears throat> excuse me, to photograph him while he was uh, practicing. But instead, he starts work walking straight at me, directly at me. And I'm looking through the viewfinder. And I can see that he's got this, this beaded sweat on his head that you can see here, which was what, what was so popular you know, at that time. And I'm shooting for Gatorade and, and these things. I'm going, please, I start praying, please don't wipe that sweat off. <laughs> so I'm, he's, 
But if you know cameras, I mean, he's walking straight at you. It's very complicated. It's the wrong lens. So anyway, how, you know, how, uh, how, how is this possible for me? I'm standing in this, in this private place with him. So let me, I'm going to walk through the journey to get to that position over the 45 years of my career. Um, so should I hit that one first here? Um, I'll, I'll leave that up for a minute. Uh, in, in 1969, um, I had a scholarship to Washington University for fine art. And I was drafted and enlisted in the, in the U.S. Air Force. And uh, I was released after three years during the Vietnam War. And I returned to St. Louis in 1972, my hometown. And um, I had to figure out pretty fast, what are you going to, how are you going to earn a living? How are you going to provide for myself and my family? And I had this, um, I had this passion to, to be a creative individual and to work with that. But, so I, th I thought to myself, how am I going to do this? Start painting real fast, which was what I was studying. And you go, nope, that's not going to happen. So I, I go, I, I decided to talk to a former professor of mine. And she got me a position with um, some professional photographers just out of, you know, this. She remembered me from before I had left. And um, so that's. I had no idea about professional photography at all, and uh, these guys got me this. Uh, this one guy loaned me his his uh, his Nikon, and he got me a pass to a Cardinals baseball game in St. Louis. And um, this is very early on. This is about 1973. I'm about 26 years old, and I'm I'm standing on the field with. Um, Hank Aaron and the Cardinal baseball players, Bob Gibson and Lou Brock, the big stars, and Stan Musial. And you don't know what that's like for a kid from St. Louis. Um, my dad listened to every inning. Um, you, you like bleed Cardinal logos, you know. Um, it, that town is just crazy about that team. So for me to be standing there even for a weekend was pretty amazing. I got a, I got a, a sequence or a shot of a, a guy at third base uh, still 19, about 1973, that was the first season with them. And uh, I got this shot, and I, the, the agreement was, I give you this pass, but you have to go into the, you know, and show that to the, to the front office, and they approve or not, and they pick what they want. And um, I showed the guy this shot, I thought I got it, I don't know, these cameras, you know. And uh, he said, wow, this is really good, I'm going to give you a pass for the, re the rest of the season. And I, I in my, myself, I'm going like, let me see that. <laughs> Are you talking to me? I was looking around. I said, okay. I mean, yeah. And so now, you know, my shirt's moving like this. Um, and just to go back and tell my dad that this is what I was going to do was everything to me. Um, so this is an early shot. And I'll try to walk through some of these details. I've got a lot to show you. But um, and, uh, my wife will give me a tangent sign, when I, which, I, which you should give to me right away. But um, let me see how this works. You can, if you see Randy Hundley's face with the, he's with the Cubs at that time, 1973, like his life is going to end here any second. Um, well, this guy, I'm shooting from the third base side, and this fellow over here, this guy from United Press, on the first base side, he showed me his, he saw this somewhere that was published with the Cardinals, and he showed me his shot, and, and Bernie Carbo, the sliding Cardinal here, his, his face is identical. So they're both, they're both going, I'm going to die. <laughs> and... And they, they hit each other. You know, it's pretty typical. Um, so then I'll show you some other. Um, this is the day that uh, Bob Gibson, a famous Cardinal pitcher, retired. And this is typical of the assignments that the Cardinals would give me. I, I was freelance for the Cardinals. I wasn't working on staff, so it was by assignment. I'd go to um, 80 out of 81 games because I was so excited about this, and they fed me. And... They, after about the first year, I discovered that one of the other photographers says, why aren't you up in the press box where they, you know, you can, they feed you? What, what do you mean? So I didn't even know, so then I started, that's where I, <laughs> I spent my evenings at the stadium. So this is, this is Bob Gibson when he retired, um, very, very famous pitcher uh, in history, and I wanted to, I'm always thinking as an artist more, I'm not so much of a technician with a camera. I learned things, but um, I wanted to, I wanted to, get something that nobody else had. You can see where everybody else is. These are all the f other photographers and reporters. And I wanted to get a, I, wanted, I went behind, behind Bob. And I wanted to get a feeling for what he was feeling. So if you're standing there in front of 40,000 people, a very emotional day, 
after this great career to to say goodbye. So that's 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 the feeling. I, I think this is still a big print at the stadium in in uh, St. Louis. Um, this is show you some other frame. I left some of these as as negative frames so you can see. That's 35 millimeter frame. This is Hank Aaron at bat in St. Louis. This is the year he broke Babe Ruth's record. I got the swing of one of his 700th home runs. Um, it's we're archiving all this, so it's kind of complicated to to deal with all these negatives. But um, this this is what that looks like. I want to show you some of the way that 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 looks in its in its raw form when you get it. Um, here's another. Um, this is what I call sequencing, and this is this is a, this is uh, Lou Brock. Um, who's probably the most famous cardinal from that era. He's, um, he set the single season uh, stolen base record and he still holds that. That's 1974. Um, he, um, he, 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 this, is, this is an example of what I call sequencing. And you, can, you, you get to see the ballet this way, whether than just, a, you just you, if you had a single frame like this, this is three 35 millimeter frames. And um, I have a print of this out there that you can see how that looks in, in reality. But it's, you can see the, when you're, f you're filming sports, uh, there's a fluidity there. Like it's like a ballet. And, and um, it's, you know, I, I'm always looking as an artist at things. But you learn, the, you know, I knew, this, I knew the game too. But in this, in this instance, you can see this ballet happening. So Lou, at number 20 there, is about to hit second base. The umpire is moving. See how graceful that is. He has to get in a position. Happens to be other famous players in this shot. That's Joe Morgan, another Hall of Famer like Lou. Uh, Dave Concepcion runs past doing his job. And you can see Pete Rose in, in left field leaning because they're supposed to lean towards second. So you, you get all those, you include all those, um, those elements to tell a, tell a uh, photojournalistic kind of approach to photography. Um, <coughs> this is what we're, this is Lou Brock right after, this is the evening that he broke the single season record, and he broke Ty Cobb's record. He's, he's a real gentleman, and he took me in as a young man. Um, if Lou Brock put his arm around you on the field, the rest of the players then agreed with that. And for some reason, he took me in. He saw I worked hard at what I was doing, and he asked me to do some private things for him. But this, this is the day he broke the single season record, Maury Wheel's record and Ty Cobb's record, and went on to set the, the, lo the, the long-term record. Um, so it's right after he stole the base. We're all in the field. There's a lot of reporters. It's a very historic moment. I knew, where the, I knew where the umpires kept the bases. They keep extra bases, not just what's on the field. So I, I had this plan. If that was a night that we were waiting for this night, everybody would show up, a lot of, a lot of reporters around the country and a lot of photographers and reporters and Sports Illustrated and everybody um, and um, I, r I knew where they kept these bases, so they, they go and get the base that you stole for the record and put that, you know, for the, in history, they get it right away. But I had this thing in my head, I wanted Lou to hold this base. I went and got another base, and I scribbled this 105 on there that you can see on the base, and I, I ran to that, I ran to the clubhouse, and I pushed my way past the crowd that's around him at his locker, and he knew me, you know, at this point a little bit after a year, uh, he's actually an ordained uh, minister now. Um, um, but his kindness was in his heart back then. Um, he, I push up to him. <laughs> I kind of get in there, and I, I, I hand him this, ba this base, and I raise the Nikon to shoot it. One of the reporters go, Lou, what, do you know this guy? What, how, <laughs> how wide of an angle is that? And that's why this big smile that you see here, because he's absolutely naked at this time. He's a... <laughs> He's about to shower, and the guy says, this can go in our newspapers everywhere. <laughs> and that's Lou's reaction to that. And um, that, um, that actually, I was working for United Press, and I ran upstairs, and I, I, they used to have teletype things at the stadium. So I, I processed that, and I got that out. You had to do that really fast to beat all the other wire services. And, and um, um, the, the guy was right. That, that ran in every newspaper in the country and helped me build this career. And, and I was paid a, a whopping $35 for that. <laughs> just, just wanted to let them know still that they, what they didn't do for me. Um, here's another, um, uh, oh, this, this, I go too fast here, no, okay. 
This is, this, is a, this is a photograph in 1977. Um, I said we were researching all this, actually I can name these dates. Um, it's what I call editorial photography or photojournalism. And that's the career I, was, I started, started believing that I was going to follow. And um, um, this, this evening changed my mind about that. Um, it's kind of the easiest field to get into because it doesn't require so much equipment and, and all of that. You can, you can have a Nikon and you know, it's a couple lenses and make your connections that way and then you work for the newspapers. But this, this changed my mind. Um, this is a rookie for the Cardinals and, um, excuse me, he made three errors and struck out three times. He sat on the bench, this is a night game. And I'm at the end of the dugout, and I'm packing up my equipment slowly because um, I'm just watching him. He's crying. He, he, essentially, his life is ruined. In his mind, his life is ruined. He's probably the same age I was you know, at, at that time. And I'm watching him, and I'm debating, um, do I raise my camera toward him? Yeah, he's a, it's, it's a very emotional thing. It's still emotional for me. But um, <coughs> he... Um, I, I, I see this beautiful light, the lights shutting down in the stadium. The light you see on him is just the, from the press box up top where Jack Buck is doing his wrap up for Camo X. So that's that last light you see on him. And so here I am struggling with this, this as an artist, seeing this beautiful composition and this man's emotion. And um, so you can see I went for the art. <laughs> <laughs> So I raised the camera, and I, 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 I think I have two frames on this. And as soon as I did, he jumped up and, and raged toward me, toward me. He was screaming. He said, this, this is what you guys do, isn't it? The guy, this guy's life is, my life is ruined, and you want to put it all over the, all over the newspapers. And um, I mean, he's crying. You can imagine, fighting your whole life to get to be a rookie with the Cardinals, a very important baseball team. And he sees that in me, and I, 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 so it's hard to explain to somebody, it's hard to explain art to somebody who's raging at you. <laughs> so I said, I said, this, I, I, I work for the Cardinals, I'm not, I'm not with the newspaper, I'm not with Sports Illustrated, I'm not working for United Press tonight. Um, this, this is, and he, he did listen to some degree, and I said, this will never get out, I'll never identify your name with this, and I never have. Um, this, my, one of my sons found this in the archives of the Post-Dispatch in St. Louis. This is uh, a day that, uh, that Lou got the 3,000th hit. You know, very few people have this, only 20 some odd players in the history of the game got that many hits. And this is Stan Musial, the other Hall of Famer for the Cardinals, two most famous players in Cardinal history. And then there's this guy in the back here. That's me. <laughs> So <laughs> I'm in somebody else's shot, which is not popular, but anyway, we have some record of that. And I'd also take, I'd also take some other assignments at that time if you, um, oops, let me go back one. Yeah, so then I take some, these are, if you follow tennis, this is in the 70s, these were number one ranked players. This is John Newcomb and, um, and uh, Stan Smith. So that, that completed the, that was about, 1978 or so. At that time, I'm really analyzing what am I doing here, and I, I, have, to, I have to be really serious about this, and I was making progress with, I wanted to leave the field of pho photojournalism because of what I told you, and I started my own studio, and I, it was progressing really rapidly, and I was, uh, that, that next few years at the end of the 70s, and I, 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 I worked hard all the time. God opened doors for me, and I followed, I followed those leads. I was taught by my parents, my dad, and my grandpa that you, you, you work hard. Um, and so that worked. That's, this is studio. You, I, I had studios and you start earning what it takes to open a, a large studio and all the equipment, state-of-the-art equipment and maintaining all of that. So by 1980, I opened up uh, a studio in Chicago. I moved to Chicago to shoot fashion. And this is an example of how that that was happening. These, these different doors open up, and these, it's uh, you know I'm still I'm still amazed by some of these things that that occurred. But um, so I started getting into the fashion field, and then to be in the fashion field, you had to be in Chicago. 
that was the next big city to move to. So I moved out of my hometown, and I haven't lived there since. But um, um, we we opened up in Chicago, and this is an example of directing beauty for some, you know, for whatever the whatever the uh, uh, occasion is. Um, and then um, this is another example of that. This is uh, Jennifer Beals. I don't know if you remember the star of Flashdance. If you remember the movie in the 80s. She's a very big movie star, and this is a series that we did um, for, um, for her to uh, secure that role in Los Angeles. But, I'm, but I guess what I'm trying to relay here is the transition I've made to, I'm starting the transition to make the camera be my art, um, instead of just a way of earning a living with it. Um, you know, it's this constant struggle of being a painter and how uh, impossible it is to earn a living as a painter. And, and we have, we're developing a big family. And um, anyway, so this, this will show you what, what you do when you're directing something like this, a beauty, a, this is called a beauty, beauty shot, like for the cover of, you know, a magazine. Like I would direct exactly where I wanted her fingers. And I move a light so that the shaft of light, you know, the strobe lights would move so I could see, this, see her left eye. You know, things like that. So very subtle movements with lighting and camera position and the perspective on the, on the subject all add up into an emotion that you then create with, these, with a professional model. So you can move from frame to frame. Uh, and then the creative process is a mutual creative process with, um, with these professionals. Um, here's another example of a portrait around that time in the 80s. This is Jacques Israelovich, who was the first... Uh, violinist for the first chair for the uh, Chicago Symphony. Um, this was in my studio, and uh, Jacques was an interesting um, subject. Um, you, have to, you have to always solve this personality. There has to be a personality that works there you know, for the subject to surrender what they want. They'll tell me what, this was for an album that he was producing. And this is you know, Stradivarius. I think he said it was about 100,000. And and I asked him if I could touch it, and he said no. <laughs> so, but he said he would, he would after we finished, and he said, um, I'll play something for you and your crew, which was unbelievable in the studio, and it's, the sound, you know, it's kind of sound proof in there. But um, he, um, he played Vivaldi's uh, Four Seasons for us, and it was amazing, right? Imagine that close, you're like four feet away from him. Um, then, then um, about 1980, because of the fashion world and where that's centered, I moved my studio from Chicago. I was only in Chicago for about two years. I moved my studio to um, New York City because that's where, that's where all the models were, and that's where the clients wanted you to be. So um, even at that time, the expense of doing that is tremendous. You have to, you have to, you have to be working. You have to... Yeah, I never really quite got along with New York. I mean, it's, it's so cutthroat, and this business is a pretty, pretty cutthroat anyway. But um, um, you, you, have to, you have to provide what your clients lead you to. So this is Cindy. Um, um, she, she became the, the biggest model and the most successful model in history now. Um, I, uh, we, I knew her really well. She, I photographed her quite a bit, mostly these beauty kind of things because use different models for different, different aspects, uh, which you, know, you could trust them, the photographer would recommend. But she's booked all over the world every day, so it was very, bec because of the trust we had developed over a few years, she always gave me time. Um, here's another example of a beauty shot with her. Um, and these are used, that, this time my, my images are in Vogue magazine and Town and & Country and you know, these national magazines. And um, here's, um, Make sure I don't leave anything out of here. Yep. Um, so here's uh, well, here's just another example of um, of a model that I use quite a bit for for beauty. And these are this is you can see this is raw film. So I can see that I shot four by five film, which is called large format film. Everybody knows photography enough. So you've got like six sizes of film, and it becomes more difficult the larger the format. And um, you don't actually get to look through the camera; you look above the camera. It's complicated, and I didn't want to learn all this stuff because. I still wanted to be a painter, and uh, I'm doing all this, and so it's night and day. Um, but, but you can see in this, this case, I left that as a full frame to show you what that's like. Um, and then I'm going to, um, Carolyn and I thought this would be a good, interesting um, thing to show you here next is, 
This is, this is uh, I'm going to show you what it's like, almost a pace at which that you, you would shoot uh, something like this. this. This is fashion again, it was for some client or magazine, and probably about this necklace, but um, it's a large format again, um, a four by five. Um, uh, this is Terry May. Um, she, was, she was one of the very top models in, in New York in the 80s. She, um, she's extremely creative. You, you, could al you almost couldn't stop her. So you, once we got everything, once we got everything styled, like the lighting and the premise, and the art director agreed that this is the way we want to go. With Terry, this type of model, you would just let her go, and uh, because she wanted to create, she's an artist. It's like a, a live choreography going on. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna um, go through this about as fast as we would shoot. There's a series of images here. Now this is one. This is one of her. Uh, this is one concept. So she start here, then you go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. See how much she could create in that length of time. So it's knowing this presence and knowing as a photographer how to allow this to be a collaborative effort. They wouldn't get to be impactful images unless they were there were this collaborative effort. So the subject had to surrender and create with with me, no matter how much I knew about it. Here's another sequence. One. This is about how fast I would be shooting. That's how fast the next one would come up. So she's got to think this up and be ready. Two. Three. Four. Five. So that's what she, that's, and so you would hire different models for these purposes because she was, a, you know, a, a, a dancer and could do these things. Um, now I'm going to show you an example of around that same time, we're in the mid 80s or so. Um, we'd have to shoot, um, you know, on location sometimes. So this is, this is in Connecticut. So we travel up to Connecticut from New York. Sorry, I block your view when I'm in there. Um, so this, this is uh, in Connecticut, and we're shooting for an equestrian magazine. And so you have all the, you have to use all the composition, all the other factors you do for photography anyway all the time. But now you're on location, so you add all these factors. Travel, get permission to be on this land, this beautiful land. Um, get, the, get the writer there, get, per, get, get a permit. Then you're going to deal with um, the weather. And they wanted this horse to jump exactly in the right spot, and I wanted it in exact the perfect composition of where they were placed and where the writer's head hit, the ears had to be exactly right. Um, and then you're dealing with horses, <laughs> <laughs> which is, you know, very fun. Um, this is another example of location shooting. It was a, this is in the French Alps, um, and I'm looking at that shaft of light on the road and the writer, I want him to hit that spot and that's when I'm going to fire. It's complicated, and you know you've got all this you've got all this going on. But if you look at the composition, composition is everything. He fell a few times, but he kept going, and we got into that sunlight there, and we got a successful, successful shot there. Um, I gotta keep moving here. I can see. Um, okay, now now this is really miracle number one was the Cardinals. Oh, you know, just that that moment with them and them saying to me, "Here's your pass." It's all like a pass to my life. Um, this is this is what I call miracle number two. I was shooting in in New York at, during the same era as Richard Avedon, who's the number one photographer of the last century, especially the last half century. So we're shooting in there the same time as he is, and he's starting to exhibit at that point. And I was thinking I better start exhibiting too. And I I still was struggling with my my need to paint, and um, uh, he. Um, he, he, right now, uh, I noticed that um, studying, because I'm archiving all of my material, one of his prints recently sold, a silver gel print, that's when they're done in a dark room, not digitally. He passed away in 2008. Um, he did, a, he did a, a print that sold in the 80s, an exhibition of Marilyn Monroe that sold for $1,000. That's when the art photography was, was in its infancy. And in 2008, the same print sold for $1,100,000. So 
So that now the world of art photography, and yes, I'm, we're putting a lot of our things in safe deposit boxes now. <laughs> so we'll figure, we'll figure out what we're doing with that. But that's silver gel, and, 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 um, and I was always grateful that for what I had um, established with my studios and, and the knowledge I had develop, developed, but I wanted a brush. And, and so I, it got to this turning point, it's miracle number two, where I actually got enough knowledge and enough freedom to, to start creating with, with the camera, start painting with the camera. Um, and that meant, like this study here, I'd have a concept and I'd work through, uh, this is maybe four hours to do something like this, and I plan it ahead of time and my crew is there, um, the subject, I was working with the very top models in the world at that time, so I knew they could handle whatever I would throw at them. And they're all very tasteful, figurative things, but they're about designing with the camera, and I started realizing that the camera was my brush, and the light was my oil paint. And then I could start doing this. It was a tremendous, tremendous change for me um, to realize I could do that, and that's where God had led me with that. Um, and I'll show you this, and I've got, actually got this actual, but this is a Polaroid, it's a four by five Polaroid. And I was, uh, this is what you work from. I was talking to a friend of mine here, Jack Joliet, the other day, and he says, how could you base these expensive photo photography sessions on these little pieces of paper? And I said, they became, they became your, your heart and your intellect. Everything had to go through this, through these Polaroids. This is a four by five Polaroid. And you can see this is me folding this in 1983 or four to create my composition. You didn't have a computer, there was no safety net. You had to just know your profession. And these little Polaroids, and this actual one is out there in the hall because Joyce asked me to bring some artifacts, so I did. Um, this is a couple more examples of those kind of, those kind of portfolios. Um, um, then I, I had a concept for, um, I better keep moving, right? Um, uh, I had a concept for, sh for Photograph. I always love boxers and the psychology of photography with, with the physical parts of photography. So I had a concept to, and I went over to Brooklyn, uh, Gleason's gym in Brooklyn and I invited a, uh, several boxers, professional boxers, to come over to my studio if they would and I would image them one by one just like if you were a professional model. But I wanted the psycholo psychology of this and I'm very carefully talking through this with their lives and then I'm trying to image that. Um, this is Ricky and this is 1987, I would say. That's Reno. That's Don. I remember all their names. Um, then, go back, going back to designing with the camera. This is to show you, this is what Carolyn, my, this is my wife Carolyn, and we would design um, with the camera. We would do these private sessions together and it's designing with the light. And she was such an actress at that point and the ability to model and to interpret mutually. So I'm looking for, looking for fluidity, I'm looking for grace, I'm looking for gracefulness, I'm looking for chiaroscuro, the light to dark, and, and a painting of her essentially, and she's told me this is her favorite photograph, and she's been photographed quite a bit. And um, this, I, I brought this, you can see I'm working with the light and, and the shadow all around, but I brought this al also to show you a contact sheet, and that's how we would move through from one to 12. We did 60 frames with this particular image, this was done in 1989, um, and you could see that how she would change through the 12, one by one, as we would move through. So I'm moving the light, I'm moving the camera, she's moving her expression and everything else we would do. And here's one more. This is her in a studio in more high fashion in, in the studio in New York. Um, so from there, 1990, we moved back to Chicago. I was more interested in, in getting back into uh, photographing uh, professional athletes, and only this time I was creating them from scratch, these images from scratch. And um, I wanted to, um, that meant, that meant they, like this is Alex Rodriguez, the famous baseball player. He's now fourth on the list behind Babe Ruth. This was shot for Gatorade and for Sports Illustrated, and I, I shot a lot of athletes for Gatorade in Chicago, that's where they're based. And you go kind of where these clients lead you. So I'd open up a, another large studio in Chicago and uh, they would fly these, these athletes in from all around the country and then they'd spend about six hours with us. We'd build, a, we'd build, we'd build gyms, sets for, of gyms, replicate a, 
uh, locker room in the studio and um, and they would they would come in for about six hours and a limousine would pick them up and they would go and um, he's he just retired last year I kind of follow all these people that I've met you do get to know them a little bit um, you know it's a very personal thing this is um, an Olympian Marion Jones also for Gatorade very complex individual um, I photographed her a couple of times for Gatorade and Sports Illustrated. This is my studio uh, in Chicago. Um, um, you have to get, I always found you have to find a way to relate to your subject. And if this, this image isn't going to get where everybody wants it to go and where I want it to go as an artist unless you can get this relationship going pretty fast. And so um, she was, we found a way to work together and we got that done. I, I, re I really like this image. Um, she set the world's record for women's 100-yard dash in the Olympics. Um, here's an example of shooting on location again. This is with uh, like movie lighting in a gym. So it's this, this athlete dunking the basketball maybe 50 times till I got the image that I want. We've got movie lights coming through those windows. It takes all day to set something up. Um, here the, I would still accept some, some photojournalism. This is the shark on, uh, during a tournament and um, a lot of protocol with, with photographing uh, inside the ropes at a, at a um, golf tournament. Tom Watson, Barry Sanders in a game against the, the Chicago Bears. Um, now, um, this now is back to the, back to the Bulls. They, uh, they had asked us, if you remember, to photograph all of their players. This is the day that I had a sitting with Michael Jordan, which is different than editorial and him just doing what he wants. This, so this is a sitting with him, which means I'm going to direct him. And, and this is pretty intimidating. You know, he has, he has like six colors of Maseratis that he would come to practice in. Depends. <laughs> There's always a crowd with him. Um, he's, this is 1998, the last year of his career. And um, his, his assistant brought him out from practice and um, um, the, the Bulls, had, like I said, the Bulls had asked us to, to image their, portray all of their players the last two years of his career. Um, my producer and I, when we left that meeting, they had seen my images in Sports Illustrated, the Bulls, and uh, they, um, they asked us to portray all of them and their coaches, and we, we, we left that meeting, and uh, Carlos and I were going, did they just ask us to, this is impossible, you guys, to get this assignment. It's not for, it was for the team, for the play of the players. Um, we couldn't believe it. So I'm going to describe how this is, what this is like um, and how you not have, I couldn't probably do this at my age here. I, I just turned 70 a couple, a few weeks ago. Your heart's beating so fast, you can't show it because it's just like in a game with him. He's a, he's a professional in every minute. Every minute of what he does is that way. The assistant brings him out. Um, he he were to be introduced. We've got our background there, that steel from Chicago that my assistants would, ha would hang, and you would have liked hanging those, Mitch. That was fun. Um, so the heavy, heavy steel back there, because I wanted to relate the strength of that team and the strength of Chicago. And this is to tell their story for a two-year period. And uh, she bring, he brings, him, brings uh, Michael out, and we walk up to each other, and generally that's what's done with a photographer. You're the head of this, this scene that's going on. He's, um, he's six foot six, I'm six foot two. And he comes, up, he comes up to about right here on me, like this, too close. And he goes, he says, you know how much I get paid for doing a sitting at this point? And I said, no, sir. And he said, one million dollars, let's go. And, I, <laughs> and I, said, I said, yes, sir, let's go. And I turned around. <laughs> So I'm thinking to my, I got to do something great because this is an opportunity that you know, doesn't come by and you just don't get a sitting time with them. You just express that. So we, um, when you're photographing these enormous celebrities, you have to have such focus yourself and you have to be very clear and you have to execute what you're doing fluidly. There's no, you lose them. If you lose them, it's over. I only had you know, maybe 20 minutes with him. Here's a couple more of the portraits with the bulls. Stennis Rodman. And this, I put this up here because this is the kind of thing you put up with with, with these celebrities and athletes in particular. They do what they want to do, and you go with the flow. 
And we actually use this in our book, uh, uh, Bill Winnington. And the same thing here with Steve Kerr, who's now the, he's a very famous player then, but he's also the, the most famous coach in basketball right now with the Warriors. So then, um, I'm going to go back to where we started. The Bulls guys trusted me, the head office, they let me go anywhere. I could have spied for other teams. It was amazing. I was in their lockers, I was in their practice facility, I saw their game plays, I saw their tapes. They trusted me. Um, I think that's what built this career. Um, they let me inside. Um, and this, this is the same image I showed you at the beginning. I'm not going to finish that, finish that story. Only this is how Nike used it. They bought this image. Um, this is how they, and I always like this, what do you believe in? And um, he, he bought it for his foundation. It was on the cover of USA Today. It was offered the cover of Time Magazine. It was in a feature article on Time Magazine. All because of that miracle and this, this happening. So I'll go back to that story that I started with. So he's, he's uh, about where you are, Dave, from me. And he's walking fast at me. And I'm holding this long lens, and I can see through the, the 35 millimeter. So it's a very small little viewfinder. And I'm seeing this. I'm seeing this, why this was so successful. And it's the most valuable negative that I have. Um, it, why it was so successful is because this very famous man was photographed all the time for these things and movies and everything else was him breaking down and being human in, the, in this private situation. So once again, he's got this towel in his hand. He's walking straight at me makes that more difficult, but I'm looking in the viewfinder. This is a full frame. That's all you see. So the depth of field, you know, cameras uh, from the nose back, so it starts going out of focus fast. There's a lot of pressure, and I'm going, I'm going to lose this. This is a special moment. He's walking directly at me. It's, you know, it's fast. He's got this towel. I'm praying. Don't wipe. Please don't wipe. Please don't wipe that sweat off. That makes a shot. He's got this towel. He wipes the sweat off. My heart sank completely. He's so fit, the sweat came back in like three seconds. <laughs> I'm not kidding. It came back immediately, and I fired four or five uh, uh, motor-driven frames, and this was one of them. Um, this, so that was, that was uh, one of the things that led to the publishing of our book and all these images, and this was the lead image for that, and that's what the book became the bestseller for the New York Times and Wall Street Journal because of how famous they were. Uh, but then we decided, so in order to publish the book, we're dealing with these fellows. That's, that's, that's what happens. The lawyers, the Bulls, the NBA, um, the, the, you know, the team itself, they, you know, dealing, with, dealing with them. And this is the owner of the Chicago Bulls and the Chicago, Chicago White Sox. So I had this portrait of him. This is really fun, dealing with all this. I thought I was going to die during the publishing of that book. So I don't know. It cost because of what the NBA wanted and what the investors paid for this, and uh, the book cost a million three to publish. 100,000 books, 79,000 books sold in two weeks, um, all of which the NBA got, and I got my name on the book. <laughs> but it's because of guys like this, really. He's not a bad guy, but I photographed him a couple of times, but he, we wanted to photograph him with his seven rings. I asked him, what do these, these rings cost while we're shooting this? Because I want to relate. He says, do you mean to get the rings or to buy the rings? And I said, well, I, I was thinking, what is, what is that ring worth? And he told me each one of those are 35000 apiece. All the players get those. Uh, so that's, that's, that's the, um, I'll show you some more fashion. That's the 90s, and we move into the 2000s. Um, so this is like an interior shot of um, fashion. You set this up with a, I thought ladies might like to see some more fashion, so all the sports talk. Um, but so this is inside for our Swiss colony or Land's End. Uh, this is shooting on a, on a location, what that's like. And in order to get this horizon to be behind her, my crew dug a, a three foot deep trench so I could get my camera. This is what this takes, it's so physical. Uh, so the camera is actually on the sand level, which raises the horizon line up because that's what the client wanted there. So this poor crew that I had who traveled around with me all over the country, they had to dig a three f big enough trench to get me in. That's what I'm saying. So, so I get that camera there. All those things you do to get this, these, these physical aspects. This is in Mexico, shooting swimwear for these clients. There's another interesting portrait in the 2000s. Um, at this time, we're switching over to digital. digital um, this was still film, but we're switching over to, to digital and I'm maintaining a large studio in Chicago. 
Uh, it's very complicated and and uh, uh, it's all it's it's very stressful work sometimes. And in this case, it was. This is this is Emily Roth Pulitzer. She's the heir to the Pulitzer fortune, one of the wealthiest women in the world, and they wanted me to uh, go to St. Louis and photograph her. Uh, she was a curator for St. Louis Art Museum, and she was the uh, wife of uh, the last Pulitzer. And uh, trying to get a trying to get a portrait with her was pretty interesting. We shot inside. I, she has her own. This is her own Richard Serra sculpture outside of her window, and she kept looking out there. And I thought, we better go out there because this isn't working. And as soon as we got out there, she felt she felt at home and natural with. It. And I asked her just to stand at the little bit of a skew with this. And you can see the smile, and she wrote me a wonderful letter later thanking me for this. She's in her 80s at that time. And then um, we're in, um, there's Emily Pulitzer. We moved to Holland, 2010, and I thought we'd get a quieter chapter of our lives and stop with these. Still doing some assignments in Chicago, but I closed my big studio. And Carolyn and I uh, moved to Holland. And I thought it'd be quieter and, um, you know, still do some shooting, but then I didn't expect to meet and partner with Joel Skuntanis. This is Mr. High Energy Creativity. I you know a lot of you know him. He's a great friend of mine. Um, and with his, his generosity and collaboration, we, we, we did uh, this series with the Detroit Lions. And this is Calvin Johnson, you know, the biggest star for the Lions over the last several years. Uh, and he was a real gentleman um, when he walked across the field to, to do this portrait. Um, we had been, they had told him about my past, and that kind of made kind of eased us into doing this portrait together. And um, just a real gentleman. And he, he's six foot six again, and solid muscle. And I'm thinking, please don't kill me. <laughs> That's what you think, because you see him on the field and the things these guys can do, and these players. And uh, but no, he was actually a very sweet man, and cooperated in every way. Here's uh, uh, Matthew Stafford from that series, a quarterback, still a great quarterback for the Lions. And then uh, our local Kirk Cousins, also this is for his book and uh, right after he signed with the, with the Lions. Uh, can't find more of a gentleman. We told him he was like, should be apply for like Captain America <laughs> or something, because that's the way he looks, and it's his attitude. Um, so, you know, I'm in, I'm in Holland and um, trying to decide if I'm shooting and what am I doing. And thanks to the generosity of Joel in particular, Amy Haygood, uh, Scott and Shelley Millen, Millen, and several others here, um, we're continuing to shoot. And we, um, we um, just recently opened a, a small commercial studio with Mitch and I uh, over there, my new partner. We're, he's 22, I'm 70. <laughs> I, I don't carry much. <laughs> and he teaches me, and I teach him. And these are some these are some images here locally. These are my favorite bakers. This is Pops. These are these we did this series for their restaurant, telling their story. It's like I'm doing a movie. You do a, a series. Um, this is Jacob, troublemaker. <laughs> Mitch, and Sam. And then we also participated in a great program here called Big Read, and I put a, a few of the veterans up here that I photograph for Big Reed. This is Rich and Barry and Bob. These are all combat veterans from Vietnam. I owe them. I owe Dave. Um, this is, um, uh, also these are my favorite celebrities coming up. This is a program we do with the Boys and Girls Club. This is Diana. This is AJ. This is Michael. I got one minute left on here, on my timer. She'll be so proud. And um, this is Todd, which we call the orator. <laughs> he was actually speaking and talking like this the whole time we're forward. So that's why once again you go with this, you go with this, go with the flow. And um, we're we're also in the midst of, like I mentioned, we're in the midst midst of the daunting task of archiving and exhibiting my this still film collection. I didn't really realize the. Uh, we saved all of it, but there's thousands. There's up to 20,000 images that I have. We've been coding and archiving that because I was from 1973 to 1998. It's all film. 1999, I switched over to year 2000 to to digital. But the, I had a, a couple of national galleries through word of mouth contact me about exhibiting, and um, 
what you know what they're what they're <laughs> I get this call and they're going we want to exhibit vintage film <laughs> I, I'm thinking I just finished this but if you think back I started shooting 1973 some of those baseball things um, so um, last page apparently um, this is my career and I did get to produce my art so thank you very much We do have a few minutes for questions here, if you'd like to ask Barry some questions, oh. or Mitch what it's like to work with I'll Barry, see. or even if you want to ask Carolyn what it's like as a model, you may do that Those too, are all so. bad ideas. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm happy to answer any questions. I'd love to. Yes, sir. We'll come over here. Yeah, thank you for sharing your art with us. Um, can you relate to us the transition when you went from recording your art on uh, film going to digital uh, did you have any problem or was yeah. it natural no um, eventually again it was another learning process but you had to for clients it's you can imagine uh, all only one who really saw the f the moment was the photographer up until about that time and for clients it's so essential because you can see everything so you can see that Polaroid take a look at that Polaroid if you can outside when you leave that's all you could go by. But now when I shoot, you, can, you shoot to eyelashes. You can see the sharpness of eyelashes. But it was, it's a lot of, you know, one of the problems is it like doubled your equipment that you had to have again. So the digital backs and everything are so expensive. I resisted for a while, but the clients needed it. So and I was still shooting pretty heavily in Chicago then. So yeah, didn't like it. But <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, I was interested in the photograph of the 105 on the base. Um, you were obviously shooting in film at that time. Yep. You, you knew yep. you had a good picture. How do you get that picture? How many? You got to get in the dark room and develop that right away. So, and that was at night um, because I was shooting for United Press, so they want you to get that out onto the circuit as fast as possible. So they these these press services maintain a dark room. Uh, uh, and this teletype um, type of machine that's just rolling. Uh, and so you go, you go up there, process the film, print it wet, find the one you want. You think you've got it. You don't know. It's not like digital. You don't know for sure. So I went through all of this to get this image. You still didn't know. That's one of the other reasons with photojournalism. It's like, but now you can see it on the back of the camera. But I had to go up there, process the film in a dark room like you would any, you know, um, print it wet. Um, run the run the fi run the print wet on this teletype, and it goes out all over the world like that. Yeah, it's uh, crazy. So you're like, you know, and you get paid nothing. You know, at that time when I was a kid, and they knew it, and <laughs> that's you know, that worked. Barry, you talked about your crew. What, what's a crew like? Yeah, sorry, I, I like to give them more credit because you can't do these you can't do these high level images without that. You have to have sometimes. Uh, when you're doing the photo photojournalism, really, you're doing that by yourself. However, if I were doing that now, I would still have Mitch there because he's brilliant and he watches all that, those aspects of the, c the computer. Um, but um, the crew generally, like you see, you know, like, that, like that shot of the, the model from South America on that beach. Um, so you, you see her and there's probably, there's eight of us there. There's me with the camera and you're sort of treated like you're the quarterback, and they have to protect you in every way. We have to get this accomplished, otherwise you're not hired again. So that, that image probably costs $10,000 to create for this company, for that clothing. You can't fail. So there's, there's um, hair, hair stylist, makeup stylist, clothing stylist, clothing, uh, clothing assist stylist, camera, camera assist, and lighting assist. And then there's probably a couple of runners there also. So it's like a little movie set one at a time when you get at this expensive level of shooting. So those, those people are almost always there for me in different, different amounts, but depends on what's affordable for the client. But sometimes you just couldn't create these images that you wanted or they wanted without, without these people there. I mean, you just can't do it. I, I, I don't even know if I could take a photograph by myself. 
I really, do, I'm, not, I'm not joking. And Carolyn takes, takes all of our family you know, shots, and they're, they're good. She knows what she's doing. That's assuring for all of us who struggle with photographing. <laughs> it's, it's the truth. It's not I mean. our fault. We just don't have a crew. That's our fault. <laughs> That's exactly right. You talked about some inspirational changes that also changed your career. Yep. To what do you attribute those inspirational changes? Well, I think the, you know, initially, um, you know, when you're so young, like everybody has a story in their life when they're starting out and how, how do you make these career, career decisions. And um, I, think, I think for me, um, you know, I wanted to be an artist and I thought this is impossible. I know how, you know, like, like Joel's, Joel and I related right away. We're 20 years apart, but we, we, we um, try to we take care of our family with our art. It's almost impossible. It's like making it as an actor or a musician. Like one percent gets to do this, and and uh, I I had this this passion for creating. I had there's no choice when when that's in you. My dad was saying stop. He stopped with this. And I go, I, I, you know, he's logical and a carpenter, and you know, and, and and so I think that's the main thing is I had that that passion in there. Um, I felt um, uh, I could see the I could see the the different. Uh, doors and avenues that were opened up. It, it was literally, literally uh, miracles. When you, you realize what, what I had after the Air Force, I had nothing. I'd had everything stripped away from me. Uh, my scholarship, the, the relationship with my professors. You, know, you build that up. I, I earned every penny to get through college. Um, I wanted this career and it was gone. You know, and I had to go do my duty, but that was gone. So then I also had this fire inside because of that. I wanted to um, get my life back, and that was kind of what what stayed with me till last night, I guess, this morning. <laughs> More of a, a technical question. Yep. I'm uh -oh. curious with all your moves and everything. I'm right here. <laughs> I mean, with your uh, can if you want preserving your negatives. Yeah. And keeping them in good shape. The, the, these are wonderful images from way back. And, yeah, I know, boy. And uh, preservation of negatives, I know, is a, is a tricky business to start with. And then you throw in these moves from New York to Chicago to St. Louis and back and forth. And also the last thing would be, are you digitizing your negatives now? Did you do this for a living? I'm Because these are my thoughts. I'm just an amateur. This is why I don't sleep. I've been, shoot, I've been shooting for 60 years. Well, it's because, yes. I mean, what an excellent question. Um, because you do face all that, and and um, when 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 I started about a year and a half ago, when this gallery first gallery contacted me, I shot commercially, but I also created my art in the evenings, those figurative things and things with the boxers and several things I've never exhibited. Um, I was really just satisfied with creating it, honestly, and then I didn't know my I had wonderful studio managers that would. Um, Kept these kept these things on file because um, I had this staff in New York, and that's what a lot of this was created. Yeah, so they they would you know they would just keep track of it, and so now we're facing this archiving. Uh, um, you probably think I invited Lee. I think I invited Lee to ask this question because I want to get this off my chest. But no, um, so you gotta you got. I'm discovering what this really takes. Nothing will take over a room faster or your mind than, you know, unloading thousands of negatives. You know, and Carolyn's helped me with, with coding because she's the only one that kind of knows what these were. But I have to identify all of them. So we've coded, given the codes and numbered and counted them. Then you, there are archiving companies and or you could do this yourself with, you know, high resolution uh, scanners. And then, then you have to get them into web access ability for galleries to access it, and and then you don't want to you want to handle them carefully. So we we spent about the last year, several several days of the week, um, get, just getting these organized because it's probably my pension. I didn't work for anybody. I always had my own studio. So, so I know, I know. I will see. That's I have to hand that to my my studio managers. Yes, they have to be. You want you want negatives and prints need to be in a cool, in a cool situation. Not as humidity that destroy. I've studied so much of this now, Lee, because I've got to learn and I feel this responsibility. And what I'm trying to do is to set this up 
so that my children, Carolyn and my children, have this archive forever. And they, they apparently are valuable. Um, I have a lot of the same images that other, um, you know, genre. Well, I shot mostly negative, because I, I love black and white, but transparency. So I'm shooting large format, which is two and a quarter, larger format, two and a quarter minimally with a Hasselblad, which is, I know, what Mitch wants to, sh wants to buy for his studio. <laughs> <laughs> I sold all mine. Um, so you, you, um, you get to these larger pieces of film, so you've got four by five film to deal with, and then eight by 10. So eight by 10 film is actually that big. And I started shooting that, I learned that camera because I, they were finer grain, and um, then that, that meant my prints, my fashion was on like the back, full back page of the New York Times or Washington Post, you know, the big, you know, you used to open up a newspaper, you see. So that's why I started shooting that large format. So those are all, you have to categorize all of that. Uh, it's very expensive. Um, but I, wanna, I, want, I want my sons um, um, to be able to understand this, my grandsons, who knows, 30 years from now, the value of these. And, but if I don't identify them and take care of them, and I owe this to these managers that I had, they were in the studio. Barry, mm -hmm. we want to uh, thank you for the pleasure this morning of looking at some beautiful images, yep. but also for opening your life to us to allow us to see how this Thanks, journey dude. takes place. Yeah. So let's thank Barry for the morning. Thank you.